was I and logical, keen, calculating, perspicacious, acute. I was all of these. My brain was as powerful as a dynamo. And think of it, I was only 20. It is not often that one so young has such a giant intellect. Take, for example, Petey Burke, my roommate at the university. Same age, same background, but dumb as an ox. Nice enough fellow, you understand, but nothing upstairs. Emotional type, unstable, impressionable, and worst of all, a fattest. Fats, I submit, are the very negation of reason. To be swept away by every new craze that comes along. To submit oneself to idiocy just because everyone else is doing it. This, to me, is the very acme of mindlessness. Not, however, to Petey Burke. Don't move. Don't take a laxative. I'll call the doctor. I want a Hummer. The car? Why do you need a Hummer? They're all over TV. Where you been? In the library. I've got to have a Hummer. I've got to. Petey, why? Think of it rationally. Hummers are gas guzzlers. They are connected to war. They hog the road. Are hard to park. They weigh too much. They're unsightly. They... But you don't understand. No. I'd give anything for a Hummer. Anything. 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 It so happened that I knew where to get my hands on a Hummer. My father had an old. I don't even know if it will run, but it also happened that Petey had something I wanted. He didn't have it exactly, but he had first rights on it. I had a long coveted polyepsy. I was a first year law student. In a few years, I would be out in practice. The successful lawyers I had observed were almost without exception married to beautiful, gracious, intelligent women. With one omission, Polly fit these specifications perfectly. Beautiful she was, though not yet of pin-up proportions, but I felt sure that time would supply the lack. She already had the makings. Gracious she was. By gracious, I mean full of graces. She had an erectness of carriage and ease of bearing, a poise that clearly indicated the best of breeding table, her manners were exquisite. However, intelligent she was not. In fact, she veered toward the opposite direction. But I believed that with my guidance, she would smarten up. At any rate, it was worth a try. After all, it is easier to make a beautiful dumb girl smart than it is to make an ugly smart girl beautiful. We go. Home for the weekend. Listen, <laughs> your family's well off. Do you think I could buy a down payment on a Hummer? I may do better than that. My dad's. No way. What do you think? <laughs> no way, no way, no way, no way! Mm, it would have to be fixed up. I don't even know if it will run. I can do it! You want it? Yeah! What do you want for it? <sighs> Your girl. You want Polly? That's right. Never. All right, if you want to throw away the opportunity of a lifetime, if you want to give up your only chance at getting up. It's not like I'm in love with her or anything. It's just dating, right? That's right. And I mean, what's Polly to me or me to Polly? Not a thing. It's just a casual thing, just a few laughs, that's all. So is it a deal? It's a deal. I'll draw up the papers. You'll have a year to fix it up, 
and the option for a second. Pro forma. This was in the nature of a survey. I wanted to see exactly how much work it would take to get her up to the standard I required. I took her first to the museum, then I took her home. Wow, that was a really stellar museum. You liked it? Yeah, I had a really awesome time. Thanks. Wow. Uh, Bye. Yeah. I went back to my room with a heavy heart. I had gravely underestimated the size of my task. This girl's lack of information was terrifying. Nor would it be enough to merely supply her with information first. She had to be taught to think. This loomed as a project of no small dimensions, and at first I was tempted to give her back to Petey. Make a quick call to my father, have Petey turned away at the door. But then I got to thinking about the way she entered the room and the way she handled a knife and fork, and I decided to make an effort. Let's find a quiet place to talk. Oh, sweet. One thing I will say for this girl, you would go far to find another so agreeable. What are we gonna talk about? Logic. Awesome. Logic is the science of thinking. Mm. Before we can begin to think clearly, we must first recognize the common fallacies of logic. That's what you and I are going to talk about tonight. That. <laughs> first, let's examine the fallacy called Dicto simpliciter. By all means. Dicto simpliciter is an argument based upon an unqualified generalization. For example, exercise is good. Therefore, everyone should exercise. Oh, I completely agree. And exercise is awesome. I mean, it builds the body and everything. Polly, Polly, the, the argument is a fallacy. Exercise is good is an unqualified generalization. For example, if you have heart disease, exercise can be bad. Many people are ordered by their doctor not to exercise. Therefore, you must qualify the generalization. You must say, exercise is usually good, or exercise is good for most people. Otherwise, you have committed a dicto simpliciter. Do you see? No, but this is fun. Do more, <laughs> do more. <laughs> it would be better if you stopped taking up my sleep. Oh, right. Next, let's examine the fallacy called hasty generalization. Listen carefully. You can't speak French. No. <gasps> P.D. Burke can't speak French. <laughs> I must therefore conclude that no one at the university can speak French. Really? Nobody? Polly, it's a fallacy. Uh, the generalization is being reached too hastily. There uh, are too few instances to support uh, such a conclusion. Do you know any more fallacies? I mean, this is more fun than dancing, even. Next comes post hoc. Mm -hmm. Listen closely. Let's not take Bill on our picnic. Every time we take him with us, it rains. Oh, I know somebody just like that. This girl back home, every time we take her on a picnic. Polly, it's, it's a fallacy. Your friend does not cause the rain. She has no connection to the rain. You are guilty of post hoc if you blame her. I'll never do it again. Are you mad at me? No, I'm <laughs> not mad. Well. Then won't you please tell me some more fallacies then? All right. <laughs> let's try contradictory premises. Yes, let's. <laughs> Here's an example of contradictory premises. Mm -hmm. If God can do anything, can he make a stone so heavy that he can't lift it? Of course. But if he can do anything, he can lift the stone. Oh, yeah. Um. Well, I guess he can't make the stone. But he can do anything. Okay, I'm all confused. Of course you are. Because when the premises of an argument contradict each other, there can be no argument. If there is an irresistible force, there can be no immovable object. If there is an immovable object, there can be no irresistible force. Do you see? <laughs> do you know any more of this cool stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's enough for today. We'll talk more tomorrow. Okay. I'll take you home now. Okay. You can think about everything we've talked about today. Mm. 
Any business to order? Um. Uh, she'll have the uh, free range chicken with rosemary and lemon. And I'll have the moussaka. You guys want anything else? Uh, two Caesar salads. Thank you. Our first fallacy tonight is called ad misericordium. Ooh. <laughs> Here's an example of ad misericordium. A man applies for a job. When the boss asks him what his qualifications are, the man begins to sob. He explains that he has a wife and six children at home. The wife is a helpless cripple. The children have no food to eat, no clothes to wear, no shoes on their feet. There are no beds in the basement, no coal in the cellar, and winter is coming. Oh my God, that is awful. I mean, that is just really awful. Yes, yes, it's, it's awful, but it's no argument. The man never answered the boss's questions about his qualifications. Instead, he appealed to the boss's sympathy. He committed the fallacy of ad misericordium. I'm sorry, do you have a handkerchief? Next, um, let's examine the fallacy called false analogy. A student should be allowed to look at their textbooks during an examination. After all, surgeons have x-rays to guide them during an operation. Lawyers have briefs to guide them during a trial. Carpenters have blueprints to guide them while building a house. Why then shouldn't students be allowed to look at their textbooks during an examination? <laughs> okay, see that is the best idea that I have heard Ever. Polly, the argument is all wrong. Doctors, lawyers, carpenters aren't taking a test to see how much they've learned students are. The two situations are entirely different and you cannot make an analogy between them. Still think it's a good idea. Right. Next, let's try hypothesis contrary to fact. Ooh, sounds yummy. <laughs> Listen, if Madame Curie had not happened to leave a photographic plate in a drawer with a chunk of pitch blend, the world today would not know about radium. True, true. Did you see that movie? That one with Madame Curie and her gorgeous husband? He is so amazing. If you could concentrate for a moment, I would like to point out that that statement is a fallacy. Maybe Madame Curie would have discovered radium on a later date. Maybe somebody else could have discovered it. Maybe any number of things would have happened. You cannot start with a hypothesis that is untrue and draw any supportable conclusions from it. They ought to put that actor in more movies. How come he isn't in any movies anymore? Probably because he's dead. <sighs> the next fallacy is called poisoning the well. Oh, weird. <laughs> Two men are in a debate. The first one gets up and says, my opponent is a notorious liar. You can't believe a word he's going to say. Now, Polly, think hard. What's wrong? I watched her closely as she knit her brow in concentration. Suddenly, a glimmer of intelligence, the first I'd seen, came into her eyes. Well that's not fair. I mean, that's not fair at all. I mean, what chance does the second guy have if the first one calls him a liar before he can even speak? Exactly. 100% correct. That's not fair. That first man has poisoned the well before anybody else can drink. He has hamstrung his opponent before he could even start. Polly, I'm so proud of you. No. You see, you see, these things aren't so hard. All you have to do is think, examine, evaluate. Come on, let's go over everything we've talked about while we eat. Yes, let's. Hearted by the knowledge that Polly was not altogether a cretin, I began a long, patient review of everything I told her. Over and over and over again, I cited instances, pointed out flaws, kept hammering away without let up. It was like digging a tunnel. First, everything was work, sweat, darkness. I had no idea when I would reach the light or even if I would, but I persisted. I pounded, clawed, scraped until finally I was rewarded. I saw a 
chink of light. And then that chink got bigger and the sun came pouring through and all was bright. Five grueling days this took. But I had made a logician out of Polly. I had taught her to think. My work was done. She was worthy of me at last. She was a fit wife for me, a proper hostess for my many mansions, a suitable mother for my well-heeled children. Now, it mustn't be thought that I did not love this woman. Quite the contrary. Just as Pygmalion loved the perfect woman he fashioned, so I loved mine. I was determined to acquaint her with my feelings at our next meeting. It was now time to change our relationship from academic to romantic. Uh -huh. today we will not talk about fallacies. Really? Why not? Listen, darling. We've been going out for five days now. Mm -hmm. We've been getting along really well. Yeah. I think it's clear that we're well matched. Hasty generalization. Excuse me? <gasps> Hasty generalization. How can you say that we're well matched on the basis of only five dates? <laughs> <laughs> the dear child had learned her lessons well. Hun, five dates is plenty. After all, you don't have to eat a whole cake to know that it's good. False analogy. I'm not a cake. I'm a girl. <laughs> uh, perhaps the dear child had learned her lessons too well. I decided to change tactics. It was obvious that the best approach was a clear, strong, direct declaration of love. Polly, uh -huh. I love you. <gasps> you are the world to me. And the moon, and the stars, and the constellations of the heavens. Please, please say that you will be with me, for if you will not, I will languish. I will refuse all meals. I will wander the face of the earth, a broken, shaken shell of a man. Ad misericordium, playing on emotions. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> I was not Pygmalion. I was Frankenstein, and my monster had me by the throat. Frantically, I fought back the tide surging through me. At all costs, I had to keep cool. Well, Polly, you certainly have learned your fallacies. You're darn right. And who taught them to you, Polly? Oh, you did. That's right. So don't you think you owe me something? Uh, I mean, if I had never come along, you never would have learned about fallacies. Hypothesis contrary to fact. Polly, you can't take these things so literally. I mean, this is just classroom stuff. You know that the things you learn in school have nothing to do with real life. Dicto simpliciter. Unqualified generalization. Will you or will you not go out with me? I will not. Why not? I promised Petey Birch that I'd go out with him. <laughs> you can't go out with him, Polly. He's, he's a loser. He's a rat, Polly. Poisoning the well and stop shouting. I think shouting should be a fallacy, too. All right, you're a logician. Let's look at this thing logically. How could you choose Petey Burke over me? Look at me, a tremendous intellectual, a man with an assured future. Look at Petey, he's an ass, he's a loser. He's a man who will never know where his next meal is coming from. Can you give me one, one logical reason why you should go out with Petey Burke? I certainly can. He has a hover. So cool. 